Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we're surrounded in this beautiful place with the doors open, connected to all the beauty around us and connected to the beautiful flowers, the rainbow of the, the new, new setting on our table, our worship table. We're just so grateful, God, for all the beauty. Help us to see it in the world and help us to see it in each other. And may your word, your holy word, help us with all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we go back to seminary. It's about the year 2005, I think. And it was not what you would expect from a bunch of seminary students. It was a class on, not coincidentally, the great stories of Genesis, including the story of Noah's Ark. And it was actually, it was the first ever online class I'd ever taken. It was the first one the seminary had ever tried. And so there was a lot of experimentation. And the pr professor, what he did, did something very basic. He set up a blog, a way for us to respond to his questions, because we weren't able to talk back then. We didn't have Zoom. We weren't going to do a conference call. We, he, he set up this blog where we could effectively email and share our answers to his questions with all the members of the class. And then he had this great idea. He asked all the members to comment on each other's, all the classmates to comment on each other's posts. Basically, he was creating an online debate, right? What could possibly go wrong with an online debate? If you're looking for an example of human capacity for nastiness, that class ended up being example A, especially, especially the week where we were looking at the story of Noah's Ark. You'd expect, of course, online the debates about politics. Yeah, that can get nasty, of course, but at a seminary, a seminary debate about Noah's Ark, that beautiful story. <clears throat> As I think back to that class, it actually was quite shocking. <laughs> and the nastiness was, and you know, a lot of people were involved in that. And it, the comments got shockingly personal, so much so that the professor basically had to warn us that he'd shut the thing down if we didn't do better. And thankfully, we did do better. But it was embarrassing, and it was shocking, and it was completely human. Now, the story of Noah's Ark is truly a beautiful story. It's, 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 it's beloved by kids, and it's a heartwarming story. It's like those flowers, these beautiful flowers. It just, it, it radiates. And you know, you can buy plenty of toys. You go to any toy store, you're going to find Noah's Ark and with, filled with beautiful plush animals that kids want to play with. A wonderful, heartwarming story. And yet, when you read the entire story, our reading today is actually only the end of the story. If you read the entire story, it talks about, it's about how God feels about human propensity for sin. And how frustrated and, yes, infuriated this can make God. The Apostle Paul, he wrote about himself. I might paraphrase a little bit. He said, I can't help myself. I do the very thing I know I'm not supposed to do, that I shouldn't do. In that, he wrote this in Romans, I believe. And in, in those words, he's putting his finger on something that the Bible talks about repeatedly. That somehow, deep inside us, there's something that can very often lead us down wrong paths. All of us are susceptible to that. And the story of Noah's Ark 
It wants to remind us of that, and it wants to remind us of how frustrating and infuriating, infuriating that can be to God. And after all, if you go to the beginning of the story, the flood was born of God's judgment on humanity. Hmm. But the vital thing to see here in this reading and in this great story is that it's far from only about God's frustration and judgment. It's also, and this is the defining part of it, it's also about God's enduring relationship despite human sin. The story just does this gigantic pivot, and this is the pivot. It does this gigantic pivot from judgment to God's everlasting providence. It's actually called the everlasting covenant to never destroy that way us that way again, putting the rainbow in the sky as a sign to remind us of that, of that promise, an everlasting promise. Everlasting is a long time. And because of that, it, 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 this story is really, it's not meant to make us tense. It's meant to do the ob opposite. It's meant to help us breathe easier because if God is essentially promising in the future from thenceforward to not be waiting for us to make mistakes and to be ready to pounce on us. That's what the promise is. Now, I may get into trouble here with some theologians. And maybe, you know, my professors back at New York Theological Seminary. With all due respect to the great American preacher, Jonathan Edwards, from the 18th century. He did a sermon, and that sermon was quite different from most of his sermons. He did this sermon, it was called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Very famous, it's worth a read. Maybe the most famous sermon in the history of our nation. It's some serious fire and brimstone. A sermon in which Edwards, he likens us human beings to being like spiders dangling, hanging by just a simple thread, one thread, hanging over the pit of despair, a hellish pit of despair. Mm. I think that sermon's emphasis on a God who's ready and, 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 and almost sounds eager to pounce on us is at odds with where this story of Noah's Ark takes us. God's promise to Noah in that rainbow is to never flood humanity again. And it's an, it's an unconditional promise. It's not prompted. No one asks for it. No one does anything to, to, to earn it. God just does it of God's own volition. That's grace. That's God doing this. It's just there. It's there and there's nothing that can change it. It's an everlasting promise. It's done. And because of that, we don't have to... To, to panic if we mess up. This is the promise of a God who knows, who knows we're not perfect, and yet still wants an everlasting relationship with us. I find that takes all the pressure off. If you think about our own relationships, isn't it when, well, you know, so, isn't it when we, our own flaws, that when our loved ones or our friends see those flaws and accept us despite those flaws, isn't that when a relationship is able to move to the next level? That's when a relationship gains durability and resilience when we don't have to hold our breath all the time for fear that some bad thing might pop out of our past. That's when a relationship stops being so precarious and starts to feel on solid ground, on dry ground. And it's ready then to really take the next step and develop. 
our reading today, the story of Noah's Ark, about that rainbow, the ending part, it's the ending part of this overall story. It was likely written, a little historical context, it was likely put down in writing at a time when the Israelite nation was in exile. It was the time when the, basically the nation was destroyed, the great temple of Solomon in Jerusalem basically destroyed, and the Israelites were su suffering. It was a miserable time under God's, and they felt under God's punishment. And that rainbow, when they saw this story, it was written in this time. It was put down in this time, I should say. It was an oral story before, but it was finally put into to, to, uh, it, its form that we receive it now. That rainbow would have given, it would have been experienced by the Israelites in exile as an invitation to a renewed relationship with God who the Israelites assumed had abandoned them. It would have given them confidence to take that relationship, to renew that relationship, and then take it to the next level, knowing that God had made that promise in that rainbow, and it was forever. And so an important way, and an important way to see this story about the rainbow is about taking our relationship with God to the next level, which is what Lent is about, and which is what Jesus is talking about in our next, in our second reading. When Jesus began his ministry, the first thing, basically the first thing he said was, repent and believe the good news. And those words like that rainbow are like an invitation to a deeper relationship with God. And so a cartoon from my cartoon file. The caption on the cartoon is sort of at the top of it. It says, shrinks summer job. And the picture is of a guy in a, he's a lifeguard up in a, you know, a lifeguard's chair. And um, he's uh, on the beach, he's at the beach. And the, out in the water, there's a guy who's swimming and struggling. And the lifeguard yells out to this guy who's struggling, I can help, but first you must admit you have a problem. I think Jesus is saying here that when we are in touch with our flaws and share them with God, trusting that God can help, that's when our relationship with God especially blossoms. When we accept that God is ready to forgive no matter what we've done or not, not done, when we trust in God's promise to walk with us no matter what, that's the promise. And it's a promise to all of creation. Lent is an invitation to renew our relationship with God in preparation for Easter. And it begins with considering where we need help from God. We're invited to consider what things we might want to let go of, for example, angers or obsessions or addictions, any of which can overtake our lives. The Lord also prompts us to consider what new things we need in our lives, engaging with the Bible more, praying more, helping our neighbors in need, finding ways to do that more often, forgiving someone or reaching out to someone who we think We need forgiveness from. These are all wonderful Lenten goals to share, to share with God. All of it premised on the idea that we need God's help 
with these problems and that we want to admit them to God as a starting point. You know, online communications really can, I don't, everybody knows this, online communications really can be a problem. A big reason for that is that, that you know, if we're blogging, for example, or we're even often emailing, we don't necessarily know who it is on the other line, or we may not know them that well. We certainly can't see their facial expressions when we say something. We're not looking at them eye to eye, even if we do know them well. And sometimes that means eh, we're not as sensitive as we might otherwise be. Online communication can be a problem because we're not face to face. Well, know this, friends, know this. God, Jesus, wants a personal relationship with each of us, a trusting and open relationship, a relationship in which we trust God with our innermost secrets, not afraid to share anything, confident that as that rainbow reminds us no matter what secrets we share, God will not abandon us. That's an everlasting promise. Amen.